you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Judges chapter 6. We're going to be there for a little while. And, and we're continuing in our series called Shameless. And we're talking about the shame that we deal with. And, and over the last several weeks, we've talked about trauma. We've talked about past. We've talked about a lot of things that may... They may perpetuate shame in your life, embarrassment in your life, whatever. But today we're going to kind of lean into this idea of inadequacy. Like, I just don't feel like I'm enough. I feel like I'm inadequate to the challenge that God has for me. Um, and when you feel inadequate, you can typically respond in one of two ways. Like, you have this idea that you're going to prove people wrong, or you just give up proving anything and you just kind of bail on it. If I'm inadequate, I'm just not going to do anything. I'm just not going to get involved. And so when I first started preaching, I was young. I think I took my first church. I was 23 years old uh, when I started pastoring my first church. And, um, and it was, we had a great time at that first church, but there was one Sunday night and I'll just tell you, I was green, man. When I preached in my first church every Sunday for about the first year that I preached every sermon that I preached, I'm not talking about the length of service. I'm talking about just the sermon was anywhere from an hour and 15 to an hour and 30 minutes every week. And I know some of you are like, man, Pastor Vince, you could preach for an hour and 30 minutes. No, I can't. I thought I could, but I'm really only good for about 35, 40 minutes. Then the rest is a whole lot of rambling and yelling, okay? And so, but they were patient with me, and, and, I, I, and I thought, man, I had it, and, and I didn't. And so, but one night, we were Sunday night, and this was back when Sunday night service was a thing, and, and only the people that, that really... Well, I don't really know, even know how to define them. On Sunday nights, you had about one-fourth of the amount of people that came on Sunday mornings. And so Sunday night, service came along, and, and I really didn't want to preach because I was really tired because it was Sunday night, and I was gassed from that morning. And so, like, I showed up, and in the back door walks a gentleman named Hoover Lewis. Now, none of you know who Hoover Lewis is. Maybe if you do, it's coincidence, but... Hoover Lewis was a legend in this area, preacher legend. This guy's dad's name was Herman Lewis, and Herman was what was called a circuit preacher. Herman would get on his horse. This is how old these people were. He would get on his horse on a Friday, and he would go pastor a church Friday night, go pastor two churches on Saturday, and then go pastor three churches on Sunday so that there was an opportunity to have church in these counties. So Independence County, Izzard County, Stone County, like all over the place down there is where he would go. And so like he was a legend. This guy, man, I, I struggle pastoring one church, and this guy's knocking out six of them in a weekend. And so his son Hoover was born and Hoover grew up to be a pastor also and he planted a bunch of churches in the area. And so when he walked in on Sunday night, I was like, oh yeah, I'm about to rip the roof off this place with this sermon. I threw my notes aside, I wadded my Bible up and I, did, I just gripped and ripped for about an hour, man. I, had, I was sweating and screaming and crying and snot. It was good, it's good stuff. Uh, yeah, I don't know how much Jesus was preached because I was just trying to show out for Hoover. Okay, I'm just being honest with you. So I get done and I'm just wringing wet, man. I had, thrown my, I had a suit on, I threw the coat off and took my tie off and was pre man, it was one of those, okay? I was burning the place down. And I get down from the platform and Hoover walks right up to me, boy. He comes straight over to me. He said, Pastor Vince, I just got to tell you, it's one of the best sermons I have ever heard in my entire life. And I was like, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, I'm so sorry that I slept through half of it. <laughs> I was a little confused in my 20s. I was also very humbled in my 20s. And Hoover said, I preached a revival this weekend. He said, and we thought your church service started at five and you'd be done by six. But your church service started at six and I didn't want to be rude and just get back in my car. So we had to sit here through your service until you were done. But I'm so tired, I couldn't stay awake. And I'm like, huh, well, man, thanks, thanks. He's like, and his wife was like, but it's really good, Pastor Vince. You did such a good job. She was a sweet little lady. She's like, you did such a good job. as a good sermon. You got a little wound up. And I'm like, yes, ma'am, I did. And, and they walk out, and I was like, huh. 
And then how many of you know, sometimes those are the perfect moments for God to kind of step in. God kind of said, Hey, you really ramped it up for Uber. I was like, yeah. He was like, it's almost like he called you. Ouch. (laughs) Ouch. He said, you were too, so busy attempting to prove something to this guy. And Vince, all the proof you needed for what you're called to do was the fact that I called you. So we, sometimes we wrestle with inadequacies and, and sometimes we try really hard to prove something to people, to impress the right people around us, to preach in a way that people, they had either admire or at least acknowledge it. And we want, we want people to enjoy it. We want people to like us. And it's not just preaching with anything. We, we kind of fill this out rather than just going, Lord, what is it you'd have me to do? And then Lord, teach me to be okay with that. I know that when we start a real life church, there was a season where it's really easy to start getting into some of the, some of the things that were being said about real life. And, and they were always good things, man. I've never seen a church grow that fast. I've never seen that many people show up in that short a time. I've never seen, and man, you'd start hearing that thing and start going, yeah, we're, we're killing it. We're doing good. We're doing good. And God had to just grab me and shake me a little bit and go, hey, I just told you to preach and pastor and love this community. Don't you worry about the numbers. Don't worry about that stuff. You start worrying about that stuff, you're going to get off track, Vince. Lean into me. I'm enough. And I wonder for some of you if if this idea of inadequacy that the enemy has convinced you of in yourself, this, this reality that the enemy has told you that you're not enough, the enemy has told you that you're not equipped, the enemy has told you that there's too much baggage, and they have told you that, and now it's not the ability that you lack, it's the obedience that you refuse to step into with God. And so we're going to talk about where inadequacy comes from, and there's a couple things, and I'm going to share three of them real quick for you. The first one is unfair criticism. We live in a world of unfair criticism that happens for some people from birth up. We've talked about that a lot over the last couple weeks. These things that we say that stick. I I wish you'd have never been this. I I can't believe you did that. How come you do this? And and we walk through some of that unfair criticism in our our childhoods with teachers, with bosses, with friends, with spouses. And it gets really, really hard for us to believe that we can do anything because the criticism is so heavy. A second reason that inadequacy falls on us is unrealistic compliments. Unrealistic compliments are, you're the best, you're amazing, when in reality, sometimes you're not. How many of you know that's the reality? How many of you know when you deal with unrealistic compliments, what it does is it creates a pressure in your world that you just can't live to? And so then you feel like you fail every time because you didn't reach this pinnacle. And that's a hard place to live. And so unrealistic compliments are are a thing that I I can remember my mom telling everybody that I was going to be a professional baseball player when I grew up. And I I got got to this certain age when the reality sets in. The reality is never easy. You just get to this place where you go, I'm I'm really average. I'm really okay with being average. I'm all right, because that just means God had something else for me. But when I had to realize... My first thought was, my mom's going to be so disappointed because she's told everybody I'm going to play for the Cincinnati Reds. Now, why anybody in the world would play for the Cincinnati Reds, I don't know. (laughs) That's what she would tell people, and I used to get tickled at her saying it, especially as I got older. Even in my adult life, she would just kind of look around and go, man, you know, Vince, you should. Mom, really, I love you. I love you, but I wasn't that good. But a mom is a mom, and so she was momming to the best of her abilities. But unrealistic compliments are there. Third thing is this, unwise comparisons. You know, if you'd have done it like this, I don't know why you don't act more like, we see this in a lot of different things, in sibling groups and people around us. If you're in a really unhealthy environment and you're doing that to your spouse, well, so-and-so's spouse does this. And it's unwise, but it's also super unhealthy. And what it does is it creates feelings of inadequacy. It creates this manipulative leverage that people use to destroy relationships and to control people. And it's awful. It's not what we were intended to do. And it's also the thing that when God nudges you, 
I'm, how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand on this, but just I want you to answer in your heart. How many of you have felt at times God going, hey, I got something I want you to do. And you're like, yeah, wait a minute. Like we, Jennifer and I were in Colorado last year and we were there helping a church planner get started. And, and we took a day and we'd go to the Royal Gorge. And I don't know if you've ever been to the Royal Gorge, but it is an enormous hole in the earth. Okay. And there's a thing there that you can zip line across the Royal Gorge. And I'm like, I'm risk taker. I'm down. Let's figure it out. Now, <laughs> luckily God stopped me. Okay, no offense to any high school student, but if you're going to strap me up in something and push me over a massive hole in the ground, I'm going to need a little more dependability than a kid that probably lost his keys on his way to work. Okay, <laughs> I'm just going to need some more than that. And so I just need it. So we go over there and I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And then I got there and sadly, I was too heavy at the time to ride it. I say sadly, part of me was like, thank you, Jesus. Israel. But I was all up for it until I got right to it. Some of you do this with God. Oh, you, you'll claim it, man. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Until he says, here's the strength, now go do it. What, uh, well, I mean, I know that's what it says, but Lord, I got, I got some stuff. No, no, no. The verse says, I'll give you the strength. Go do it. But Lord, I got this baggage. But Lord, I got this past. But Lord, I got this relationship. But Lord, I got this. Lord, I got, I've heard people do it with, every, Lord, I got these kids. <laughs> Lord, I've got this spouse that I don't think they're, I don't think they're going to want to do it, Lord. And so you can ask me, but you're going to have to check with him. You're going to have to check with her. And I don't know. And we'll pass it off on whoever else we can when the Lord has called us and he's given us the ability and he's given us the capacity and the bandwidth and everything that you need to accomplish it. And the one thing that's missing is not that you believe in God, but, it's the, but you believe in yourself to be able to do it. Because if I were to ask you, how many of you believe that God can do all things? Until it pertains to you. And then you doubt it. So let's dive into Judges chapter six. Judges chapter six, if you haven't read the book of Judges, man, I challenge you to do it. If you like adventure, a little suspense, a little Samson and Delilah is found in the book of Judges. There's a lady named JL that runs a tent peg through a king's head right into the, it's gruesome. So if you're into true crime stuff, Judges got it, all right? There's some stuff in the book of Judges, man. I'm telling you, people don't read it because it's in the Old Testament. I'm, read it, all right? There's some good stuff in there. And in the book of Judges, we find this man, Gideon. And the largest story of Gideon is that Gideon helps deliver the people of Israel from the Midianites. And he does it in a way that's kind of interesting. God takes this army and trims it down to 300 people. And Gideon is left to fight this army with 300 people and God shows up all the way through it. But we're going to talk about the beginning and where God found Gideon. Because it doesn't make a lot of sense when you know the end of the story where he found him. Judges chapter 6, starting with verse 11. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Oprah. Now this is a tree. He came and sat under the tree in the region of Oprah which belonged to, the, to Joash, the Abezerite. And Joash's son, Gideon, was beating out wheat in the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. There's some interesting facts about that, and we're going to come back to it in just a second. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O man of valor. The King James says, O mighty warrior. And Gideon said to him, please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers told us about saying, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us to the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, you go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, please, Lord, how can I save Israel? I want you to listen to the language of inadequacy in Gideon. Listen to what the enemy has convinced 
Gideon of himself. How can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said, but I will be with you, and you shall strike down the Midianites as one man. I love a good but in the Bible. I really do. That's a good one, if you're wondering. Gideon says, how am I going to do this? I am the, my tribe is the weakest, and I'm the weakest of the weak. The Lord says, but I'll be with you. Now, I'll give you some context of what's going on here. Wheat threshing is something that happens throughout the Bible. We see it's a very common thing because of the region. Wheat was a crop that happened there. But to thresh wheat, you had to be in a specific place. They typically re recommended you be in a high place, outdoors. Because when you would thresh the wheat, when you would beat the wheat stalks, the chaff would fly off of the wheat and the wind would blow it away. And so then the wheat would be left. Gideon is such a coward in this season of his life, or he's so afraid in this season of his life that he's trying to do that inside a barn. I don't know if you know it or not, the wind doesn't blow a lot inside a barn. But that's where Gideon's doing this. Why? The Bible verse tells us he's doing it to hide from the Midianites. And I love it that that's what's happening. Let me give you this passage. I'm going to give you three things real quick, okay, that I want you to learn from these couple verses, these five verses that we just read in Judges. The first thing is this. God's view of you is different than you think. Gideon is in the wine press, threshing out the wheat. And verse 12 says, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, the Lord is with you, O mighty warrior. Oh, man of valor, God is with you. And Gideon, I'm sure, had to look around the barn. You talk, me? No, no, no. No, um, I don't know if you saw this, angel of the Lord, but I'm hiding. I'm hiding. I'm terrified of what's out there. So I'm going to do my job in here. Some of you right now, in regards to God, some of you are doing the things that you are comfortable with and the things that terrify you, you are hiding in the barn from. God has something great for you in store. He has purposed you. He's called you. He has given you the ability to do this. So Vince, I don't know that he has. Hang on. I'm about to give you a verse here in a second. It's going to change your world. And you're hiding in the barn. Again, it's not because you don't believe in God. If I said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How many of you would say Amen. If I said that God can do all things according to his riches and glory, how many of you would say amen? amen? If I were to say God's strength is perfect and it's made evident in your weakness, how many of you would say amen? amen. It's not God you don't trust. It's you. And you're hiding in the barn. All you're doing stuff, you're staying busy, but you're hiding in the barn. God said, I need you to come outside and do this. You'll get, you'll get better wheat if you come outside. No, 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 I'm good right here. Why? Because if I go out there, something bad's going to happen. If I go out there, something bad's going to happen, God, and I don't think that I want to do that. I don't think I want to step into that. So I need you to understand that God's view of you is different than you think. I know some of you have been convinced. The enemy has convinced you because of your past, because of your baggage, because of the failures, because of the disappointments that you have defined, because of all those things. When God calls you, you run through that filter before you say yes. If I just get some things straightened out, Pastor Vince, then I'll be ready to go. I'm going to just set you free. You don't have the ability to get the things straightened out on your own. You just don't. I mean, you're awesome, but only in Christ. In fact, Scripture tells us you can do nothing without him. So that's it's kind of harsh. No, it's, it's, man, it's liberating. You know how stressful this would be if I had to get up here and depend on my natural ability to keep you intrigued for 35 minutes? Y'all get tired of stories about my kids because that's all I got. 
No, Jesus is the one that empowers. He's the one that gives you the words. He's the one that gives you this ability. But we got to trust that God has given us that capacity when we're obedient. We say yes. Why would he give you all the stuff without the commitment on your side? Some of y'all want Jesus to set you free from everything, but you don't want to give him the credit for it. His view of you is different than you think. His view of Gideon was different than Gideon thought. Oh, you mighty man of valor, almighty oh, warrior, Gideon's like, you wrong guy. It's the next barn. Next barn. I'm Gideon. I'm hiding out. So he keeps on. Let me give you this verse. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are God's masterpiece. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a masterpiece. Nobody giggle. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. Why? So we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Did you hear that long ago? Brandon, God built you to do stuff long ago. And the only reason it's not happening in any of our lives is not because God didn't put it in us. It's because we won't let it out of us. We won't let him keeps on going where he talks about, he says, uh, and I want you to see this throughout. This is not just a you thing. It's a biblical thing. David, Rahab, all these people that had things in their life that didn't make any sense. David was an adulterer, yet God says he's a man after my own heart. Moses, Moses messed up so many times in the wilderness with God that he didn't even get to see the promised land, but yet God calls Moses a friend of God. He gets our limitations, but he also asks us to trust him beyond our limitations. He asks us to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And when we say yes, it's when we get to be a part of the miraculous. So God's view of you is different than you think. Next point is this. God has given you more than you think. He has put more inside of you than you are capable of understanding. I'm going to tell you right now, I knew God called me to something when I was a youngster, but I didn't know what it was because I didn't think this would be it. Like, I'm going to be a youth pastor. I'll be a missionary. I'll go do some stuff, God, for you, but I don't know about pastoring a church because I watched my dad pastor church and (laughs) I watched what they did to him over 40 years of pastoring a church. I don't want it. Call someone else. And God said, you forget I said, what I forget? He said, you forgot you ain't the boss. <laughs> he said, you also forgot that I'm able to equip you to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can even think or imagine, if you'll trust me. If you'll trust me. God, I don't know that I got the stuff. I don't know that I got the talent. I don't know that I got the gifts. He said, I got all of that. In fact, I'm the one who gives all that. Yeah, but I don't know if you gave it to me. Here we go. Second Peter chapter one, verse three, his divine power has given us, what's it say? All things that pertain to life and godliness. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and his goodness. Do you know what you need to say yes to God? Nothing. You have everything you need to accomplish exactly what God has called you to do. What's lacking is obedience. And the devil has convinced you to stay disobedient through making you feel inadequate. Through making you feel like you don't bring enough to the table. No one will listen. He did it to me. When God called us back home, I was like, Lord, no one No one's going to come see a local guy. I'm a bomber from 1994. No one, no one, and here's the devil. The devil's like, Vince, no one from that town's going to come and watch you preach. Nobody. I'm going to ask you a real serious question. I want you, and I want you to tell, this is what the devil does. How many of you in this room right now knew me in 1994. Hands up. One, two, three. Three people. That's what the enemy did. He took the fear of three people. The, not that those, look, those three people are here watching. 
I wonder every week. I'm like, here they are again. And I'm so thankful. But man, here I was, got the devil convincing me that Vince, no one in Baxter County is going to want to hear you talk. Not realizing that it was going to be 30 years later I was going to be talking in Baxter County. See, the enemy just twisted enough, just enough to convince us that we ain't worth it, that we don't have anything valuable, that no one's going to pay attention. And all this time, God's going, I've given you everything that you need for life and godliness. Will you step into it? Vince, I, I, I don't need your gifting. I need your availability. Vince, I don't need your toolbox. I, I, I need your heart. I, need, I, don't, I don't need your questions. I need your yes. And if you'll give me your yes, I'll answer the questions. I'll handle the. I'll make sure your toolbox is full. I'll make sure you have a team of people that make this thing work. It won't all be on you, Vince, if you'll trust me and say yes. But God, I feel inadequate. It's okay. I will go with you in this fight. Notice what he tells Gideon in the message in this verse in Judges. He says, you go in the strength you have, and I will be with you. In other words, Gideon, you give it all you got. I'll make up the gaps. If I, if, there's no way I could define to you how much God has made up in my life. How much space and talent and gifting God has poured in the gaps when I couldn't carry it. When I didn't have enough so God has given you more than you think he has. The last thing is this. This one's hard. It's less about you than you think. I often thought that when God was calling me in the ministry, it was all about me and how he wanted to set me up and how he wanted to, to do this through me and how he, how he wanted to do something amazing in me. And so I began to be the barrier for what God wanted to do through me. Because what I didn't realize is I kind of thought that God's call to me was about me. When in reality, God's call to me was about you. And you, and you, and everybody in this room, God's call to me was not that so I would be elevated, but so that you would be. So that, so that God could get to you somehow. And there are days I sit down on my front porch and I look and I watch the sunrise and I laugh. I'm like, God, if they knew, if they knew, Lord, all the stuff I cannot do, if they knew the amount of people that I've let down in ministry, if they knew the amount of times that I feel so inadequate, carry this load. And God whispers in my ear. He says, Hey Vince, I love you. I'm like, I know. I don't doubt that. He said, I know, but you're doubting you. I'm like, yeah. He said, Vince, I don't need him to know you. I need him to know me. You keep doing what you're doing so that they know me and we'll be all right. I wonder if today you showed up because it's Sunday. It's beautiful outside. And you came to church. But I wonder if today that God didn't have a plan for you to show up and then set some stuff down. Some of you are terrified to say yes. You are terrified to say yes to what God may have you do. Not because you don't think you're able. Maybe for some of you that's it. But for the most part, that's not it. You're still hanging on to stuff that is yesterday. And that's why you won't say yes. Some of you say, I, I don't know that I can walk the process out. I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can commit to the, I, don't, I just don't know. And some of you, that's what you're afraid of, that which you don't know. Pastor Vince, I messed it all up. I disappointed everybody. I dropped the ball. Hey, let me just shoot straight with you. Welcome to humanity. We've been dropping the ball since the garden. Am I wrong? You may just ask the room, how many of you have disappointed people around you? 
And yet God sees fit to use the broken things of this world to show the wholeness and the power and the grace of the cross. You know how I know? It's because he's using me. He's using a hypocrite. He's using somebody that acted one way on Sundays and somebody completely different through the week for a long time in my life. That's how I know God is able to use anybody because he uses me. And what my challenge for you today is maybe today is the day you go, Lord, I don't want to complicate it. So here I am. Here I am. What, whatever you have for me, here I am. However, I need to walk the process out. Here I am. Whatever's available. Here I am. Lord, I, I'm just tired of telling you what I can't do when you see me differently than I think you do. When, when you, you put more in me than I think I have. When in reality, none of it's about me anyway, it's always been about you. So Lord, here am I. Bow with me, church. It's not easy to feel inadequate. In fact, it's the worst. When you don't feel like you measure up. When you, when you don't, when you just don't feel like you have enough in the tank. You don't bring enough to the table. It's awful feeling. And the enemy loves this. Satan loves keeping you right there. When in reality, God took a frightened guy in a barn and delivered Israel. He took a fisherman that we talked about last week named Peter to preach boldly in the town square about a savior and the world changed. The Bible says through the teaching of just those disciples that the world was turned upside down. And if they were to write all the things that God did, the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. That's what the Bible says about God using people who didn't feel they were adequate, but made themselves available. I wonder if today, today, you showed up today, it's beautiful, it's sunny. You showed up today and maybe today God's going, it's you, it's you, I need you. I got something for you. I got a call for your life, but you got to walk it out. You got to trust me. You got to know that I'm good on this side of it and that I'm good on the other side of it. Will you follow me? So at this time, if you know it's you, come on. If you know that's what God's asking of you, come on, slide out of your seat and come on the altar and pray. Come lay it down. Say, Lord, here it is. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what all to offer you, but God, here I am. God, I don't know what you need me to turn away from, but here I am. God, I, I don't even know what step you want me to take tomorrow, but here I am. I, 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 may not, I may not have all the answers, God. I may not have all, all the things that I need to have, but here I am. And I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to offer it to you. I'm going to say, Lord, I, I, I don't know what to do, but I'm available. I don't know where to turn, but I'm available. So this morning, if it's you, then be available. Be available this morning. I need some folks to help us out praying down here. We got some people that have come to pray. If you're willing to help, I'd appreciate it. Listen, God has a plan. He has something big for you. Now, I'm just going to ask you, because there's some people that have moved, and some of you sitting in your seat right now. This is a big step. This idea, this is a big step to take this step and walk down here. But let me ask you this way. Would you be bold enough in your seat right now? You say, Pastor Vince, I hear you, but I'm terrified. Pastor Vince, I hear you, but I'm terrified. It, it's easy for me to hide right now in the barn and I can still kind of, I can be at church and I can sing the songs and I can, I can love you. But Lord, I'm scared of what it looks like if you call me out. Lord, I'm scared of what it looks like if I say yes to you. If you're here this morning, you're still sitting in your seat, say, Pastor Vince, it's me. I'm terrified. Would you put your hand up and put it right back down? I'm scared of what God may call me into. 
I'm a little afraid of what he might call. I see you. I see, I'm, I'm a, I, I just don't know, Vince. That's okay. It's okay to not know. It's not okay to be disobedient. So you need to be asking God, Lord, give me the strength to say yes in your strength. God, come find me in the barn. Come seek me out in my hiding place and show me how to say yes to you. Give me the strength to say yes to you. Give me the ability to trust what you have for me. Give me what I need to do what you would have me to do. Father in heaven, I love you. And Jesus, I pray for these people as they have come down, Lord, and they have, they have sought direction. Lord, I pray that as they are seeking direction, that you'd hear them. No one looking around. God, I pray that as you are hearing my voice today, as you're hearing my prayer today, that your will would be heard. God, that, that your voice be listened to and that Lord we would submit to it. God, I ask that you lead us, you'd guide us and direct us and that we'd follow you. In Jesus' name.